Yes, then thanks. Everyone has found some pizzas and some more snacks. That's great. Then we'll start with our second presentation. Reda, welcome on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I, I hope uh, we, we're going to go through this together with as much energy as we can. I know it's the end of the day, and uh, it gets usually hard around this time, but I'm going to try to keep it swift. You get it? <laughs> there we go. Um, before I start, a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to call out Juan about something he said earlier. OOP and functional programming cannot be best friends. So just let, let get this out of the way, and then I'll continue. I'm kidding, by the way. <laughs> but uh, let's do this. Apparently, I have to have a slide about my... What's that? Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> Uh, this is the typical slide I talk about myself. I'll try to keep it super short. I've been a de professional developer for about 15 years. Um, I start, actually, it's funny. Uh, first programming language I ever used was ActionScript, and it was an object-oriented programming. And actually, it was the inspiration that later on helped uh, people like build HyperCard and stuff like that. There was a lot of ideas from there. And then I moved to JavaScript at some point, but I didn't like it much. And then... A I think around 2010, I started learning Objective-C. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Uh, uh, and then I did a bit of Ruby as well at some point. And since uh, 2014, I've been doing only Swift and some JavaScript as well, but mostly Swift. Um, yes, these days I'm doing a lot of Swift UI, which is Apple's sort of like React, the declarative UI framework for iOS, Mac, all of that. Um, I'm also uh, working uh, for Circle, which is a uh, company based in the US, uh, and I'm doing iOS uh, there, and I'm working on their iOS projects. Uh, I've also done a good amount of server-side Swift since three years ago, and uh, yeah, I've been really enjoying uh, using Swift across the board, server and client. Uh, on the web, of course, we still use JavaScript, but that's the only missing piece. Uh, you can find my more stuff. I don't update my website as much as I used to, but it's my name.com, basically. And I'm Kaishin on Twitter. I'm not going to get into the story of why I have that nickname, but it's a nickname I had on every social media. If you go, if you find, if you Google that, you'll find me on GitHub and all of that. All right, let's get going. Uh, and by the way, you won't see any SpongeBob here, but you will see a lot of turtles. And I will prove that you can do as much with turtles as with SpongeBob. So, Swift. Uh, but quick show of hands. How many of you have written uh, at least one single line of Swift? Wow, actually. I see one hand there, but I don't see the person. I just see the hand. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, quick uh, recap of what Swift is. And so, this presentation, basically, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about Swift and then about functional composition. A lot of this stuff, Juan has already covered, to be honest. So I feel like I could drop the second part entirely, <laughs> but we'll do, we'll do it. I think it's a different take on some aspects. Um, Swift was released in 2014, uh, 1.0, and 2.0 was open source in 2015. Uh, I happened to be at WWDC that year, and I talked to Chris Latner, the guy who actually made Swift, and it was amazing because... When, when you hear about these things, it's like, I want to talk to the person who made this thing and ask them question. And I was talking to, to a random guy at a meetup about Swift. And then all of a sudden, I see Chris Latner butting into the conversation and saying something like, I agree with you. And I was like, no, this can't be. Um, that was my, my programming career highlight. Uh, <laughs> uh, Swift works on Mac, Linux starting 2.2, and Windows starting 5.3. Um, it supports OOP and FP, of course, and I, I put, so POP is, I've seen this, it's not a common acronym, but people use it for protocol-oriented programming, which is basically just using interfaces instead of just classes. Um, but yeah, I just put it there because I, I see a lot of, especially like uh, Swift developers use protocols or interfaces quite a lot. Um, it's statically typed and it inter interrupts with C, uh, Objective-C, uh, Python and JS via, via JS context, and C++ is actually work in progress. They're planning to make it a lot more nicer to work with Swift and C++ together. I'm looking forward to that, especially for uh, game development. Um, 
where can you use Swift today? Well, obviously, uh, Apple platforms. Uh, server side, uh, it's actually getting some traction there as well. And I have shipped a few, uh, couple of projects uh, there that are in production. Um, serverless as well. There's an official AWS Lambda support for Swift. Uh, it's been there, I think, for a year and a half or so. Uh, Cross-platform CLI tools, basically anything really that's not GUI related, you can use Swift for. And you can also use it for GUI things, but it's a bit iffy there because the APIs are not translated. Uh, WebAssembly, this one actually I'm super excited about. Uh, Swift to awesome. It's like right now it's not really, changes are not upstream Swift, so you have to use a fork of Swift. But when this is going to like be really nice to use and be upstream, I think I'm going to use the hell out of it because I, I don't really like writing that much JavaScript these days. Um, some notable Swift features, uh, immutable value types, and Juan earlier talked about similar. Actually, Swift and Kotlin, they share a ton similar. Like my last uh, project, I, I was looking at both, and they share a ton uh, of things. Obviously, they have differences as well. Um, mutable reference types, of course, because it interrupts with an objective C, so it needs to have mutability. First class functions, and uh, higher order functions. I'm going to talk about those briefly. And in the earlier presentation, it was already uh, discuss, uh, talk, uh, talked about basically higher order functions. It supports generics, protocols, type extensions, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to talk about all of this because it, there's, there's a lot. Uh, pointer APIs, async away, yeah, what have you. Actually, the last two could be interesting from a functional programming point of view because uh, first, for the operator overloads and custom operators, if you really like some functional programming operators, you can use them in Swift. And varia like variadic parameters, there's just a nice thing to have when you don't know how many parameters you will get. So always nice to have. <laughs> Emoji support. Uh, this one actually, well, I don't really think it matters, but they made a big deal out of it initially. So that's actually a valid function, turtle and parenthesis. That's valid code, basically. And you can, I've seen a couple of people doing it as a joke, but no, you shouldn't do that. Um, OK, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about uh, the topic. I'm going to talk about functional composition in Swift, but I'm going to try to focus on one aspect that I think a lot of people don't focus about, uh, or talk about rather, is when you're designing an API for other people to use, a lot of people just go the, uh, oh, uh, I'm going to use protocols, or you can subclass this thing. And like as an API author, I haven't seen enough good use cases of functional programming as an API, like when you're, let's say, either, even within, within your team or as an open source project. Um, so I'm going to try to focus especially on those aspects, but obviously like there's so many things we can use functional programming for. Functions in Swift. If you have never looked at the line of Swift, and I think few of do, a few of you haven't uh, used, like written Swift before, um, yeah, so basically this is the syntax, func, and the name of the function, parenthesis, and then curly braces, or you can define it as a, uh, a value. So uh, your function equal curly braces, and it's a closure syntax. So basically it's um, kind of a lambda, but the, it, in reality it's not because it has a name in this case, which is grace. And both of these are called just by the name and uh, parenthesis. This is super basic, but I just wanted to cover it because we start everything from, uh, from first principles. Um, so every function has a type, and I think one also talked about that earlier. Par parameter type and then the return type. I think most of you here are familiar with this concept. Uh, interesting because I have given variations of this talk before, and some people who haven't done much functional programming. I was like, oh, really? Functions had a type? I didn't never thought about it that way. But yeah, I mean, functions are just a type, just like any other type. Um, so yeah, in this case, the first one takes nothing, returns nothing. So we have the, uh, the parentheses and then void. The second one takes two uh, ints and return uh, adds them together. So int, 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 uh, or integer is the type for it in Swift. Um, there was a slide earlier about higher order functions. I'm just going to quickly go over it. And also first class functions, which is just a, like another concept. So functions in Swift, are they have all the standard operations available to all other types. So that's why we call them first class functions. You can uh, assign them, pass them around. You can do a bunch of things. You can do whatever you can do to an integer. You can do it to a function. So high order functions, uh, that includes also passing functions as arguments. And I will add also returning them as return values from other functions. Uh, so that way, functions just become just literally like any other type. These are super important things to have in a language 
for it to support functional programming. Like the languages I've used, I think beside JavaScript and Swift, uh, Ruby to some degree didn't have these concepts, but like Objective-C had none of this. And the one I started progra learning programming with ActionScript had also none of this, as far as I recall, it's been a long time ago. Um, so functions as values, I would be super fast with this. Um, in Swift, uh, this is a, more of a Swift technicality, but you can have let to make it a constant or var to make it a variable. And functions have the same semantics. If you define it as a let, you can change it. That's it. That's, that's the entire thing that this slide is trying to say. Functions and parameters, we have seen examples a while ago. Uh, so let's say we have a function called grace and we have a function called do something that takes another function that uh, does nothing and actually returns nothing. Just for the sake of this example, I kept it simple. So you can just pass grace to the do something function. And um, by the way, this grace is basically, I'm talking about the turtle in case you missed that. Uh, we're still talking about turtles here while talking about Swift. Uh, return values, same, uh, you can return a function. In this case, I create a function that can generate a bunch of functions. I mean, this is something pretty straightforward if you have done a good amount of functional programming. But for some people, when they see this, they say, oh, wow, you can generate functions like that. Like, yeah, you can. So like, we have this function called drop. It basically just drops the last um, n number of string uh, characters from a string. And you can see that the first one, it just calls it without argument. And here there's actually some nice like things in Swift that other languages, of course, support. But you can have uh, default arguments. So like in this case, the default is one for the count. So when I call drop last without any arguments, it just picks one. Uh, if I call it with count two, then it will drop the last two. So basically, I generated three functions just from one function. And while this example might be a bit moot because it doesn't do much, this is a lot powerful, lot more powerful when you combine it with partial application that we have seen earlier, and also you apply it with a bit more complex uh, domains, let's say. And we're gonna look at one good domain that uh, we're gonna apply some of this to. So function compositions, composition rather. Um, so what is function composition? Again, if you have been paying attention in the first presentation, you already know what this is. But it's a series of functions where each function receives input, does some additional computation, and then hands the output to the next one. That's it, like super simple. I think you can literally, I can show this slide to anyone who's never done any programming, they should under, understand this, uh, or they would understand this rather. So let's, let's go back to the last three functions I defined, drop last, drop two last, drop 10 last. Uh, we, can, we can basically um, compose them by calling, like creating another function called drop 13 last, and then just one function calls the next, call the next, until you give it the value. And you can use this by just calling drop 13 last, and then give it some string, the slow green turtle jumps not, and uh, it will remove the last 13 characters. Um, this is just to show an example of, uh, in practice, how does composition look like. Um, it looks like this, usually, but let, let, let's continue. I just wanted to put that anyway. I had the, I had the, uh, the image. I looked for the slide, not the other way around. Um, point three, this is actually something that a lot of people might have heard of but not be familiar with, but like we call the point three syntax uh, or tacit programming if, if you want to be more academically correct. <laughs> it's a, when a function is achieved solely through composition. Basically, we don't, you don't pass any explicit parameters to it. Uh, and the first example is that in, the, the one I showed earlier, it was, I, I cheated a bit. It's not point three, and it's actually imperative. Uh, the second one, you can see the declarative point three version. So it's just top 30 last is compose these three, done. There's no information about what arguments it takes, etc. Whereas the first one is kind of straddling, it's in between. Um, there is composition, but more like uh, you're calling it manually. Each function is calling the next. Whereas the, the, the other one is like syntactically, it's much easier to read because you just read compose this, this, and this. It's just e even easier to, to reason about. Okay, so now theory is nice and everything, but my, I want to drive my point with an example. And this example is not... Um, something I came up with to, uh, to drive the example. It's actually code that I took from three projects that I've already shipped this in production since I think two years and a half ago. Uh, and this is something battle tested. I've used it in many teams, but many setups always works 
pretty nice and uh, people usually really like working with it. Uh, as like I work recently a lot as a mobile developer and one thing we do is we talk to the cloud all the time. That's actually what mobile apps are these days. It's just, uh, basically nice interface for JSON basically. <laughs> you get a bunch of information from a server and you show it. Uh, so we build a, a lot of REST API clients. And this is the same for the web. If you have a React app or what have you, you always have to build these like logic to talk to a server, get response, do something with it. So we're going to use comp functional composition to build a, an API. So we're going to build an API to create an API. So basically the building blocks of how to build an API, a REST API client. Um, briefly, just to make sure that we're on the same page here, this API client will have a list of RESTful resources, endpoints, what we typically call just an endpoint. And uh, basically, we'll call some networking interface, which is a side effect, and we'll return. I'm not going to talk about side effects. I'm not uh, going to talk about network, because there, these are a bit uh, beside the, the, the topic of the presentation. But again, in the first presentation, we got a, a good, uh, a good uh, uh, introduction to side effects and why they're necessary. But this, this, this thing we're going to talk about, we're going to focus on the creation of, of this API. Um, so what, is, what does calling a REST API endpoint typically involve? Um, basically, you have, you have to do, typically, you have to do the same things over and over, like regardless of the app, the context. Uh, first thing, you have to create some client-side representation of the API endpoint. So like if you have an endpoint that does X, your app uh, need to know about, you need to represent an abstraction of that endpoint. Second, you need to add logic to transform input data into some platform sp specific request objects. So like in, in JavaScript, it could be uh, fetch API in Swift or iOS, your request. They basically, whatever thing you're using, you need to end up with some object that you call, or some configuration, rather. Um, so these, these two tasks are, are involved in every aspect. I removed two more because they're, <laughs> I had them before, but I removed them because they're mostly side effects, which is call the endpoint, get back a response, parse it, get the object back. But these two, um, like it's hard to uh, reason uh, purely in a functional way because it's by nature a side effect. You're calling something remote and getting back a resource. Still, you can make it nicer to work with in a functional uh, setup, but again, not the topic of this presentation. Rewinding, step one. So we need to create a client-side representation of the endpoint. Turns out that endpoints, they're also just input and outputs, basically um, a function. So the input data will be sent with the request, and then the output will be expected from the response. So uh, this part, let's take an example. Um, let's say we have an endpoint that uh, you can give it an ID, you get back a turtle, right? Uh, this endpoint, I could, in, in, the, in the client side, I could define it as get turtle with ID and uh, returns the, the, the object that we want. Um, now, before I continue with this, now that the goal here is that we'll try to implement this, right? This is, this is our goal, this is our end game. Like when we get here, the presentation is over. Actually, I have two more endpoints I'm gonna show just to give a, some good comparison of how this can work. But before we get there, just quickly, this is the request object I'm gonna be using. Um, this, is, this is kind of not the production version. I removed a ton of stuff, but these five things are almost always there. So basically you have to define the method, uh, post, get, et cetera. The, the, the path, so basically the URL, uh, all the slash something, something. Some. Um, small note, that custom string convertible is not as scary as it looks. It's just a uh, protocol in Swift that any type could uh, basically conform to, and you can have non-string types also be passed to that thing, and they know how to basically transform into a string. So you just get some nice uh, syntactic uh, sugar there, basically. It could be an array of strings as well. Uh, the query items for the URL queries. And the headers, of course, we always need those. And uh, some data for the body. And it's, it's a question mark is, means optional. Like we could have also no data. So this is enough to make technically any requests. Um, obviously, if it's REST, we're not talking about other kinds of 
uh, of of uh, of a uh, type of APIs or sorry of uh, of technologies. Um, so the get turtle request it gets a UID and returns a uh, actually it should be return a turtle there, not a request. But uh, that aside, um, we come back to uh, so this is the function that we need to define, right? What am I going to do inside this function? So one way, this is the imperative way that I have been doing since a long time ago. You create a new request object, right? You configure it by setting its uh, methods. So method get, sorry, its properties, and then path is turtle slash ID. And by the way, that little syntax there is just for string interpolation. Um, and so you return the request. This is the typical way with, I have done this personally for a very long time. But there's actually kind of a different way to look at this, because if you look at these single lines here, each one of them is some, trans some transformation. Like the, when you set the method to get, you're basically saying, take this request and make it a get uh, request. Well, if we look at this from a slightly different angle, you can see this shape. This is pseudocode, by the way. But just to give you an idea of what we're looking at, if we compose three things that all are functions from request to another request, so basically request transforms, then we could actually define this endpoint in a completely point-free way, basically without having any sort of, I mean, one, not 100%, we still have to pass that ID, but even that can be sort of uh, removed using partial application. Um, but I'm not gonna talk about that uh, for today. Uh, so yes, this is what we want to achieve. So uh, one nice thing I like about Swift is type aliases. And those of you who have done Swift here, they know that you won't find a code base without a type alias. Everyone loves them. You can basically say, well, this, this type is basically, we're going to just alias it to request transform. Um, and so the get becomes a request transform, which is a function that takes a request and returns a request. And what you do there is basically just block. I just took the part where I set the method and I just dropped everything else. Uh, so basically, the syntax there is create a copy. So that line that says transform.quest, uh, remember, uh, this is immutable. Sw Swift values uh, are always immutable. So you can't just say, oh, I'll take this request and just make it a get request. You have to create a copy, modify the copy, return the copy. That's the dance I'm doing there. Um, obviously, I could cheat. I could make uh, actually request a variable, but I really don't like uh, that sort of like mutation. I just don't mind creating copies. This stuff is cheap, and our our devices are so powerful these days that this is nothing. Like this is this is not something we should be concerned about. Um, by the way, Apple picked a terrible name for this language because <laughs> whenever I I Google something like Swift lenses, this is what I get. Google just suggests uh, things related to Taylor Swift all the time. Actually, I didn't really know much about Taylor Swift until I became a Swift developer. And now I know everything, like what dresses she wears, what concerts she has been to. It's, uh, this is actually, this is not, this slide is not even a lie. I was actually Googling Swift lenses because I wanted an open source library for lenses. I got this, it's like, come on. Composition. <laughs> Composition, I think it's okay. But I don't know what you're gonna get. Don't click images, you get some weird stuff. Uh, <laughs> Swift, terrible name. But, why did I put this slide here? Because actually I wanted to show an example with lenses because those of you who have been doing a good amount of functional programming know that you can do this with a what like called a lens. Basically, it's a way to make an immutable thing sort of mutable. Not exactly, but it's a tool in the functional programming uh, toolbox. And you can find open source uh, or implement your own. It's not that hard. Uh, and so if I do that, then the get becomes as simple as uh, method lens dot set and then get post becomes method lens and post. And then I, have, I can remove all this, should have put that slide in there, all this boilerplate like line one to five could go away and things becomes a lot easier to follow and read. Um, obviously you don't have to do this, but it's a nice, nice to have. Then what, what, what do I need? I need now to define functions to modify every aspect of the request. So it could modify the path. In this case, it just adds one extra fragment. So like if we have slash turtle slash something swift, then you have, you have to call this twice, basically. Uh, I also have variations that add entire like URLs, but that's, that, that's, this is the beauty of composition. You can compose this into something that returns more path uh, uh, objects. So 
instead, let's say I have to call this turtle's path many times in this in this uh, API. Well, I can just basically this is this is already like I'm creating a function from a function. I just call the path function, but with the turtle's uh, you know uh, path segment. And now turtle's path is a specialized version of this function that works exactly with this path. And I can reuse this as many times as I want. I don't have to type the tur turtle's path every time I, I need that. Um, the open close principle, this is actually a good uh, example of it, where you can extend this thing, but you can't modify the path thing, but you can extend it. And if you're making an API, that should be your number one goal, how to allow others to extend your work while not needing to actually go on subclass or do this or all of these like things that typically they end up with a lot more complicated code, hard to test, et cetera. So same for ID. Um, I'm, I'm going to go a bit faster here because what I'm doing is mechanical work. So just create lenses, create definitions for each thing. So here it's a function that just appends the ID. That's it. Uh, so in this case, uh, the adds a path with that specific UUID uh, as string. And so to now, now that I have all these things, I need to compose them. Um, sadly, or I'm not sure actually sadly or for the good thing, but uh, Swift doesn't come with a built-in compose uh, uh, operator. I don't think I don't think a lot of languages do to balance. I mean, if you put aside uh, Haskell or those that are built around functional programming, so you have to define your own, and it's not that hard to define. Especially, you can make it generic, of course. In this case, like using these, um, th like um, although I'm, I'm, it's not even generic. <laughs> this one, I'm composing three functions. And either you can use compose or pipe, depending on the direction you're composing. So the first one I go, uh, so the, the, the first uh, parameter is called last, whereas the second one is the other way around. Honestly, the name in here doesn't matter that much. You could call it <laughs> whatever you feel like. You will eventually get someone who's like, yeah, well, that's a pipe, not a compose. But honestly, like for me, what matters is basically a way to, to compose these. And interestingly, for, for this API, I use pipe a lot more because the path order matters. So I can't just call functions in any order. Like if I'm gonna do turtle slash something, I need to apply this, like append turtles first, then append something. I can't append something then turtles. So you have to be a bit careful about order of composition uh, in that sense. Obviously you can also get around that, but uh, let's not do that here. Um, okay, now I have everything I need. Uh, by the way, this is more of a, this slide, you see that I am actually uh, specifically saying, oh, that three functions, but this is not smart because you might need four or one or, I don't, no, not one. You're not going to compose one. You need two or more. Um, so you can also use variadics here and say, just take any number of transforms and just uh, call them. Like a reduce. So basically we're reducing that and every time we're calling the next transform, it's recursive. Um, this works if you're not using generics. If you're using generics, Swift does not support variadics. So you can't have a list of variadic and generic parameters because it's statically typed. It needs to know every type you're going to pass to it when it, like, you know, uh, when you're compiling. So, uh, but in this case, I know I'm only transforming requests. So I actually don't, don't need generics here. This is completely fine. Works, works great. We can, we can go with this. Now I have everything. <laughs> Now I can actually define the endpoint. So the endpoint here is well, I'm going to pipe the get function that takes a, again, takes a request, makes it get, turtle's path, and ID parameter ID. And now I defined this endpoint just by composing three functions together. Uh, there's n literally no like uh, assignments or, or anything going on here. Um, <laughs> one, one small sort of bracket sort of uh, uh, aside. Uh, I have, like five years ago, I was working at a company where we did use functional programming quite a bit in, a, in our projects, and we introduced custom operators, and that's okay uh, if that's your thing, you like custom operators, but since then I've become really careful about introducing these, because if you're building a code base that more people that are less familiar with functional programming will, will use, they might not be able to understand it. Uh, but this is actually valid Swift code, so I can actually just define an infix operator, and I can actually call the get turtles path ID parameter like that, and it works. And you can define whatever like uh, symbols you want and all of that. You have all the tools. 
But these days I'm more like, I'm just gonna call it five for Compose and, and be, <laughs> be done with this. Uh, it's also like the language doesn't really support these things when it comes to uh, uh, right clicking, as we call, <laughs> like basically trying to see the type of something. When you right click some of these symbols, you don't get a good overview. The compiler just sometimes just doesn't really uh, seem to sort of follow. But I think it got better uh, since last time I tried this. Um, to sort of kind of wrap this up, I'm just going to show two more uh, two more uh, endpoints and see like how this composition how can we take it even further. So I worked on the first one, right? Let's let's suppose we have two more. One that we can create a turtle. It's a post request to this to the slash turtles, and it requires authentication. So the first two require authentication. Um, the last one is a sign-in request, and it doesn't require authentication because that's how we get the tokens. And uh, it takes a credentials, and then uh, and and you can see here that there's some things that are common between every two endpoints here. If you take every two, you'll find something common. So this is a typical case in a lot of programming problems where you have things that are kind of similar but not quite, and you find pairs that are similar in some way, but pairs that are similar in a different way. And this is where I, I honestly struggle to find any other solution than to use functional composition. I tried a lot of things before, and they always feel like, yeah, but I'm repeating this here, or I'm doing this uh, twice. Um, uh, so in this one, uh, we're going to just quickly look at the type signatures. I love doing this. Whenever I'm working on something, I just go to a text, a text file, and I just write the type signatures of the things I need to work with, and I start working from there, basically. Uh, and these are three functions. Um, again, if you remember, request transform is just another function. Uh, so, in case you, you forgot, that's not uh, that's not a type on its own. It's just an alias. So, the first one takes a UID and a token. Now, I added a token because authentication. I mean, you will never work on a project without authentication. In my experience, at least, like I've I've never been involved in one that didn't have tokens or something uh, of that kind. The second one also takes a token and it takes an admin key. So now we have more things to work with. And the last one just takes credentials. So how can we make these three sort of uh, be composed? I think um, the, the idea here is, I was trying to say since a while ago is that you can uh, take those uh, configuration steps that you do over and over and just encapsulate them into a function. And then there you go, you have that reusable thing. And I showed a couple of examples with the turtles path, but I'm gonna show some more here. Uh, and these are common cases where I found I'm always extracting in every project, attaching auth header headers, uh, setting admin keys and all, any header basically that, that you need to set, uh, setting method to post with the correct content type. Like you always have to do like it's post, but also content type JSON. It's like it becomes repetitive and it's the same thing. And there's so many more. Uh, but so first thing we need to do is um, we define a higher order function uh, that allows us to add a single header. In this case, uh, because I didn't do it a while ago, so here it is. It takes key value and just it sets them. Um, and then we can define a another function that uses the header function, but this time this one is specialized in uh, attaching a token. And since authentication is a, is a static thing that we're always going to have, so I just pass it there as a as a as a string, and then I, I do interpolation to, to grab the token. And so now we created a new transform from an existing transform, uh, and in this case, uh, authentication. Uh, all good. Now, I need to update my two other requests. So I need to add that line. You can see it um, right there, authenticate token, the, the first one after the pipe. And the reason is before I didn't have it, but now I realize, oh, I need a token. So I need to do this. So. There it is. And by the way, I also add a token to the request function the signature because I need that token. I, like Again, if we do pure functions, there's no one who will tell us what the token is if you don't pass it. Uh, I have seen, obviously, code bases that don't do this. They use a singleton and they grab the token from somewhere. Don't do that because then this function becomes, uh, like it knows too much about the, the, the system around it. Just pass whatever this function needs. Let it do the, the work. Um, Query items, I'm not going to spend time on this. So this is the post, the second one. I'm oh, no, sorry, this is the get. This is the post. So the post one also uh, becomes piping authenticated post turtles path, admin key header, and JSON content type. Uh, you can compare these two just to see uh, what, what's, come, what's similar, what's not. And you can already see something here that needs to be refined. If someone shows, shows up to me with this, I'm going to say, hmm, we're going to pass that token to every request. That's a bit... Tedious. 
let's not do that. So this is the third one and it doesn't need that. So it's kind of, this one is kind of good. This one can give it the green check mark of code review. This one is fine. The other two, no, because we can't be passing authenticated token to every request. It becomes tedious. So this is where we talk about the extent, like making extensible API. So, so far with this API, we we're trying to just follow the steps, but then we reached a point where like, there's, there's, there's a lot of, this code is not dry. Like it's repeating things. And with functional composition, we can at any point interject and actually change behavior because it's just functions. So you can at any point say, compose more functions or, or, or things like that. And I'm gonna show here what we can do in this specific case to not repeat the token every time. Uh, so I'm gonna take a step back, let's say, or like a step forward rather, like jump uh, into the send method. And the send is basically, this is the side effect. It's sending the request. Typically, typically in any code base I've seen, you give it a request, right? A request object. And then you do some magic and you expect some data back. That's the signature up there. I think this approach, while it works, it kind of beats the purpose of functional composition because you're giving it a value that's already ready to be used. How about we don't give it the request? We give it the recipe to make the request. And the recipe is basically just a request transform. Like, here is a recipe to make a request. And uh, please make that request yourself and send it. And this small change, it, it might seem like trivial. It's like, yeah, I mean, no difference because this one at the end, you're just going to give it a, a new request and it's going to modify it. But the, 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 uh, the, the, what this actually ends up allowing is quite different because the first one, you can't, once you have that, you can't do anything unless you modify it. Again, open close principle. You have to modify the first one to add the token. So you have to modify the request itself before sending it to the, the first method. On the second, you don't have to modify the send method itself. All you have to do is create another method that, it, that comes between send and whatever thing you did before. And that method would inject the token the, the way we want. And to be more explicit about what I'm trying to say here, um, this is what I was saying. So just to, to give a bit of context, let's say this is the API client object. Uh, this one is more data side of things and it, it keeps a track of a token, a host, like the root URL and the decoder. You can ignore that one. This is for JSON decoding in Swift because we need that. <laughs> it's not like in JavaScript where JSON is, is native. Um, so if we look, if we extend this client, by defining the send method that I was showing earlier, what it can do is, well, you give it a request transform and it creates a, so basically here what we're doing is just we're creating a new request with the transform applied. So in Swift, you can skip types if, if the context is clear enough. So in this case, this init is referring to the request object that we I've showed quite a while ago. But what we can do then is define another method called send authenticated and you give it the same request platform, uh, request transform that we give it here. The, the only difference is that this one have access to, uh, to the token. So what it can do is it, it, it basically composes the original request transform and the authenticated tra transform. Uh, so basically it just injects it there. And now as a, as a user of this API, you have the choice. You can call this send if you don't want authentication, or you can call send authenticated if you want authentication. Even better, if, if other people in other teams are using this API, they can define their own send method and like call it send authenticated too. And they attach two tokens because one wasn't enough for the security team. So, but what this means is that they can extend without touching even like the, the core. They, they won't even have to touch this one. They just extend it, just add more by adding. It's additive basically. So with that, we can actually remove token from all our functions, just keep the transform. And uh, actually, I forgot to remove this, or did I? Oh no, uh, this shouldn't be here, this end token, because basically we just need the data, turtle, admin key, and ID to, uh, and properties. These tokens are not needed anymore because they're gonna be injected at a later stage, not now. And, and this thing doesn't even need to care about uh, token or authentication. Obviously, you can have a different opinion and you can say, no, I want to pass it here, but that's also fine. You can pass it here, and when you call it, just don't, don't call send authenticated, call the other send, which won't inject the authentication. Boom, 
It's up to you. Like, honestly, it's up to the developer to decide what each endpoints want, not even like the entire uh, project. And so, one last thing. Um, I get this question a lot. I actually taught some aspects of, of this in a class, I think a year and a half ago or two years ago. And one question actually that comes up is, what if we have some conditional, like I want to compose something, but only if, obviously there's ways to do this, but my, one of my preferred uh, options is to have an identity transform where it just returns the same request. And basically you can, when you check for, this is a ternary operator in Swift, when you check for instance, uh, do I get this turtle as admin? Uh, if yes, then I want to attach the admin header. Oh, so basically, here we're, in, we're just composing this function, or otherwise we compose with the identity function, which has no effect. You can do it like this. You can do if else. That's also fine by me. But this, when I have long series of compose, compose functions, it becomes a bit hard to repeat all of that and remove one thing. So I just yeah throw the identity there. It should be fine. I don't think it has. I, last time I checked, it has no performance costs because the compiler actually abstracts it away. So it's just like, yeah, this function is doing nothing, remove it. So when you actually code compiles this as if it doesn't exist, um, or rather like it will, when it will compile this one, it will compile the path within it. So it, you won't have any effect because it will always skip the if part, or the if instruction in the machine code. So it won't, it won't have much of a performance cost. Um, and to kind of wrap this up, just show some actual uh, uh, like um, some things that I, I'm using like a lot with these, like caching policy, for instance, timeout intervals. There's so many transforms I'm using. API key headers. This is also pretty common. Uh, pagination queries. Like if, if you have a lot of like uh, paginated uh, responses, ton of them. It's really tedious to keep every time for every request, like saying, "Oh, I expect a page, and it has this." So you can with this, you can define a pagination sort of transform that takes any type, so it would be generic, and then uh, like basically transforms it into a page, or or vice versa, depending on what you're trying to do. And then you can go to any request and say, "Also, I want this to be paginated or expect paginated data," and boom, you got it. It's one line basically. You add it, and then it becomes paginated. Um, so why is this? Why do we care about any of this? I think personally, what I really like about this is that it gives a lot of freedom uh, compared to other approaches. So I've used uh, both uh, object-oriented and uh, interface-oriented or protocol-oriented. Those restrict you quite a bit. Like you have to do things in specific places, specific order. With this, you decide where and when to define these transforms. It could be inline. It could be uh, global scope. It could be only in one, in one specific test or function, or basically you decide. And, and so this on the fly and in place are very important for, for this flexibility aspect of it. Um, and of course, you end up with highly composable APIs because you can just build on top of that. Um, I think this, I'm not going to talk about this because you, we heard about it a bit in the first presentation and I talked a bit more about it, but basically being able to extend without modifying. Uh, like handling special cases, testing, mocking, it's always easier with this. Um, and so because these are pure, pure functions, they're safer and more predictable, easier to test and mock, and more composable. And I always like to think of these like small Lego pieces that you put together. And uh, it's, it's insane the amount of application that you, uh, applications that you can use this for. I, I picked the API because actually that's the one I use quite a bit. But actually, there's way more that I have tried and was impressed by the outcome. Basically, these days, whenever I see builder pattern factories, I immediately think of functional composition. So like whenever you see config, let config do something and set this on the config, config, config. You see that config in 10 lines, functional composition. That shouldn't even be there. Um, this is what I was talking about. You see it in the network requests, URL paths, a lot of things. This is actually... This is actually pretty amazing because uh, drawing as a thing, like drawing anything, uh, typically you think about it as it's, a, it's an imperative operation. You just say, go to this point, or like let's say 2D drawing, not 3D. Uh, but if you think about it from a functional point of view, you can actually define the entire drawing in a function and then just pass it something that would have a side effect. So it could be it's a canvas or a starting point or whatever. And boom, you have the drawing. And then you can just change a thing in the initial thing, and then the entire drawing changes. 
I actually, this one, I'm the most, I, I wanted actually to this talk to talk about drawing, but I realized that not a lot of people draw 2D in their day-to-day -day job. So I felt like, yeah, this, I think API is more relatable, but this is actually an area that I'm most excited about is like functional 2D drawing. And uh, there is, this is not something new. This is actually super old. There was this thing that you will, like if you have been using the turtle reference, but actually there's this turtle thing about drawing and some people are not in, so they know what I'm talking about. And that thing actually is kind of very similar to this, where instead of uh, declare, it's saying exactly how the drawing um, it should be done, you, just, you basically describe it. It's like, oh, you go, go 20 pixels up and then, it's hard to explain that way, but it's when you use, use functions for that, you can compose things in a beautiful way. So for instance, a square becomes just three, four functions that draw a line, but each one with a different direction, basically. Um, this one also is a one that's getting, gaining a lot of popularity these days, but like app state management, uh, you can find a lot of use cases for this. Like on the web, of course, if you look at anything like uh, React, Flux, Elm, I think all of these borrow a lot from this. But on mobile recently, there's also kind of a renaissance of this, like both with Swift UI and also Jetpack Compose on Android. And you can find examples of uh, unidirectional data flows. Uh, on iOS, the most popular one that we use these days is uh, called the Composable Architecture. It's like TCA, uh, but there are any others. You can build your own as well, as long as uh, you have you know, a clear idea of what you want to achieve. Uh, and on Android, you would find a few of them. And on the web also, there's like no shortage of these. And for app state management, it works really nice because then uh, we got some examples a while ago, and that could be expanded to basically any aspect other that's not side effects. And side effects, they're not even that scary because with this approach, you always leave side effects last. So you do your functional things and all the awesome stuff. And then in the end, you just say, well, whatever thing, draw this or send this network request or write to the database. And I don't care what you look like. Like, I don't even know who you are. Just do your work, tell me when it's done. It's beautiful, it works. Um, styling user interfaces, I was just talking about that. So yeah, with this, my talk comes to an end. <laughs> Thank you for listening this late in the day. Uh, you can find the ideas of this REST client on my GitHub, Kaishin slash REST client. I didn't push everything, but the overall ideas are there. And it's actually functioning. That one I have on GitHub, it just doesn't have all the bells and whistles. And I think I'm done. And if there are any questions, I'll take them. <laughs> Great. Do we have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Run down with them. Don't be distracted by the chicken. Yeah. Or so the you promised to tell us a story about your nickname origin. Uh, what's that? Say that again. Uh, you promised us to tell the story about your nickname origin. Oh, Ash my nickname origin. Okay. So I. Oh my God. I didn't expect I'm gonna get a question about that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so this nickname, I had it uh, when I was studying in Japan. And uh, I think one reason I, I, I got this nickname is because uh, that name, so I have to, uh, in Chinese characters, it means vanguard, heart. So Kai is vanguard. And I, and I think uh, the reason I got it was I used the nickname uh, in, in Counter-Strike a lot. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I got it. And then it stuck. And uh, actually, I had an anecdote. I once... Uh, booked a hotel in the US. I didn't book it, but someone else booked it for me. And they wrote the name Kaishin because they know me as Kaishin, right? And I go to the hotel and say, all right, so we need to check you in. What's your name? I say, Reda. And they say, sorry, we don't have this name. I say, are you sure? Like I, I, I flew pretty far to, to get to this hotel. And I was like, okay, let me check. We have a booking for Kaishin. Is that you? I said, yes. Can we see your passport? Yes. <laughs> it's not Kaishin. You're not going to get this room tonight. <laughs> I was like, well, sorry. It's a, but yeah, that's the story. It's nothing really crazy. Um, I think it's more interesting when you look at the characters that they're used to, to write it because I, I used to write it wrong and someone corrected me and I started writing it right. So in, in kanji, like Japanese uh, characters or Chinese really, but <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. It's working. Yeah, yeah. it's working. Uh, it was nice... Uh presentation with the composition for defining the REST API. Thank you. Uh, my question there is how, uh, or if you had some inspiration from uh, DLS, DSL, mm -hmm. domain-specific languages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Uh, yes, very. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting because uh, the, this when you end up with that thing, you look at it, you think it's a DSL, but in reality, it's just functions. And the Swift later got proper DSL support with function build. They call them result builders nowadays. So you can actually define complete DSLs in Swift. Personally, I don't see the point because I think functions do the job just right. I don't need to define a result builder and define a syntax within a language that's different from the actual language. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely some a, a big chunk of my my inspiration for this was actually looking at uh, other DSLs and trying to imitate them, basically. But without the uh, the runtime for a DSL and all of that, just pure simple functions. And this is actually amazing. With functions, you can do something as close as a DSL or looks like a DSL is mind-boggling to me. There's Hi, it's an amazing talk. Thank you. Uh, what I'm going <laughs> to say now that, is, but... yeah, yeah, no, it's really cool. It's not exactly a question; it's more like an addition to to this REST API uh, stuff you you showed. Mm -hmm. In the iOS community, at least the past few years, we've been always kind of told, you know, start with protocol and all that. Uh, <laughs> and there's yeah, a famous was, talk about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what I'm going to, what I'm saying now is that I think you could add that it's really interesting to compare what you show now to, mm -hmm. you know, the protocol or in mm -hmm. the approach and see like, you know, the uh, plus and cons. I could have, yeah. Uh, because uh, doing the stuff you've been doing, um, well, as you said, mocks are very much simplified. You don't have to, when you create that stuff, you don't have to add everything and, you know, it's easy to just mm -hmm. slap the part you want and stuff like that. Um, so that's really important. Like just saying for people who are, who liked what they saw here, they should try looking into more into how they, you know, like where this applies and how this can simplify their, their own code. Because just looking at, you know, okay, you put functions around, you swap them around, it's kind of fun, but you know, what does it give it to you actually? Exactly. But if you look deep enough, it waits for you there. It's really fun. It does. That's a really good point. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, th this is kind of, and you seem to be an insider, so, so you, know, you know what's going on. But we have this kind of feud between like people who really think protocols should be everywhere in Swift. I mean, not really a feud, but more like a, you know, a thing. And I think uh, protocols, and uh, I have here in the audience uh, uh, an ex-colleague where we used in some projects a lot of protocols and the situations they were a bit hard to work with because you end up with a lot of protocols everywhere. Uh, the reason I didn't mention them too much is I wasn't aware like how much of the audience is uh, familiar with the protocols in Swift. Also, like I feel like bashing on, on protocols become a bit too sort of cliche at this point too, just like bashing on OOP. So, yeah, I, I left that out. Yeah. Any more questions? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So the question is about just the uh, developer experience. Uh -huh. uh, so you, you need to write a lot of plumbing code and maybe code that's project or company specific. Mm -hmm. How do you like introduce uh, that to uh, like new developers? Because obviously like Googling, uh, how do you get the token with Swift will not give you no. the code <laughs> you wrote, wrote. So like, uh, do you have any opinions on that? This is an excellent question because I think the biggest thing, if I had to put a slide here with drawbacks of this approach would be people's familiarity. So a lot of people not familiar with the functional way of doing things, just look at things like, okay, I don't understand what I need to do. My short answer to that is nothing can beat really good documentation. So like if, if you're the author of this and you have a team of people, you have to sit down, write, put a markdown file and write how this thing works. Give examples. Uh, for instance, give a uh, list to some of these requests. Um, if you don't have that, of course, you're letting the people basically drown because they will like, okay, what am I looking at here? What's possible to do? Uh, they won't see that from the get-go. Um, I think it's definitely a struggle. Uh, like uh, I had situations where people just didn't really subscribe to any of this. It's like, well, this, I'm not sure I need this. I can just create the request myself and pass it around and th that's actually valid you can do that but on a scale it won't work like you can do that solo but then two others will do it slightly differently they will tweak the request in a different way and then when you have 30 people in the team each one doing their so like small little thing it's not going to scale and 
for some areas like networking, I prefer to have a very like uh, like let's say I don't want to use the word strict because this is not strict. You can still do whatever you want, but at least opinionated API so that people can follow like uh, things like security networking. I usually don't value a lot how easy is it to modify things more than how easy to stay like build correct code and that's tested and all, all of it. To me, this always kind of tips the balance a bit. But to your point, it's definitely a problem and something that's always keeping me sort of thinking, how can we improve it? Uh, education is one other thing as well. So other than documentation, like education and talking, but like have me having this talk here is part of that, actually. I feel like more people need to know about this stuff because then when you see it, they don't get, they get scared. You just click around. It just functions. Like nothing really scary here. So, yeah. Thanks for the question, though. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? No. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Great presentation. Thank you. Yes. With that, thank you everyone for visiting tonight. And uh, thanks to the presenters. And I also shout out to Alex and the team at Volvo. Thank you very much for helping out arranging and fixing and putting up chairs and everything. Yeah. Thank you very much. With that, tonight. Yeah.